I would say GnRH analogs are one of the most used and abused pediatric endocrinology medicines. What we'll try to do is to go through the various uh, clinical aspects of this today. We'll try to see what is the indications which are there, which are established, where it is controversial and where it should not be used. So we have guidelines, that is the use of GnRH analogs, uh, the update by International Consortium. Uh, they have maintained that this is not an exact change, but they are telling us the updates regarding what is happening uh, the, in the recent times. So I will be discussing the topics in these following uh, categories. How to diagnose, who to treat, how to treat, how to monitor and some miscellaneous issues which we need to be uh, uh, seen. So beginning with how to diagnose. So we all know the uh, clinical diagnosis of precocious puberty, any girls with uh, breast staging more than B2 at more than less than eight years and, and less than nine years in boys, the testicular volume more than four ml. But biochemically as Sir very well told us that LH levels is the best biological parameter to diagnose CPP. A value of more than 0.2 international unit per liter can be considered pubertal, and this has a 91% sensitivity and 100% specificity. So what does it mean, Pratik? If somebody has an LH of 0.3, can it, uh, is it center because of puberty? You can be 100% sure about it. But we need to look at the clinical picture as well. Yes, yeah, so somebody has pubertal yes. onset and LH is 0.3. What does it so mean? So I would do consider looking at the assays, if it is the assays which have been used, I would say it is yes, center. So what they're trying to say is that if it is more than 0.2, nothing yes, to worry. Nothing it's 100% it is center. Yes. If it is less than 0.2, 9% of cases with CPP may have a LH which is less than yes. 0.2. This is what they're trying to say. When you say sensitivity of 91%, yes. it means that. So in that setting, you have to basically, uh, then you go there. Yes. So exactly the next point being when to do a GNI stimulation testing. So as, as we enter the induction of the ultra sensitive assays of the chemiluminescence, uh, point two is a very good marker, but there are certain situations where we have to consider doing the stimulation testing. One, when we have a clinically progressive precocious puberty, but with pre-pubertal LH values. And secondly, we have those values whether we don't know the assay, what they're being used. So it's a non-definitive pictures like 0.2 to 0.3 or 0.1 to 0.2 but the child is in progressive puberty and the bone age is advanced. So what to do in that stage? So it is better to do a GNI stimulation testing. Now, how to do this testing? Of course, uh, the guidelines mentioned when they had used luprolide uh, 20 mcg per kg, they have also given figures for triptyrellin as well. And what they say is the value of more than five at more than two hours has a 78% sensi sensitivity but 100% specificity for diagnosing precaution, central precautious puberty. So hold on there. You're saying LH has 91% sensitivity and 100% yes. sensitivity, and this is 78% sensitivity. So, which means it is going to miss 22% yes. cases of CPP. And this happens yes. anytime you see LH level less than 5. Yes. Now, what I will try to say is that if your LH is more than 0.2, don't worry at all. Yes. But if it is less than 0.1, even if it is going beyond now, if suppose they had used a cutoff of 3, mm -hmm. what do you think? The sensitivity will go up or go down? Or go up. Because oh, of so if they so what I'm trying to say is that even if your level is going about two or three, mm. it is still center. So this this is not at all helpful. Yes. Is that your confirmatory test has a worse sensitivity, sensitivity than the and, and specificity is not a problem. You use a confirmatory so test already you want the specificity. Yes, sir. So LH I would say is the best test to look at. Mm -hmm. If ninety nine percent cases you will get it. If there is a confusion and your LH is rising beyond one, mm -hmm. so if you talk about calamine yes, versus CDGP, what are the cutoffs you talk about? Five again there. Yes, sir. You say if the NRS goes above five, it yeah. is CDGP. Mm -hmm. But in calamine, it will be less than one. Yes. Mm -hmm. So similarly in peripheral, it will be less than one. So if you are going for that, don't be bothered if it is three or four. It is still central precaution because this data clearly is a confusing it's confusing picture. picture. Uh, they've also mentioned about the use of estradiol levels. So as they mentioned, random estradiol levels are not at all helpful to mention. But if you do it with the GNI uh, administration, and after 18 to 24 hours, a level of more than 50, they mentioned at 24 hours, 100% sensitivity and specificity and definitely can aid us in the diagnosis of CPP. So more yes. than 50 is huge. Yes. Sir. Like if somebody has a more than 50, it's clear. Be, the breast will be already much more. I would say the better marker would be the vaginal mucosa yes, and the breast status. Yes, so I don't do a 24 hour value in that because we have got, as you said, if you use all that, but if you look at five cutoff, it is only 93%. Yes, sir. So in that sense, mm. probably what you're looking at is LH is the best test if you look at single test. 
but it should be a pooled one. Yes, sir. Uh, pelvic imaging. Now, this is uh, we a lot of uh, times we require the pelvic imaging. So basically, just to see uterine length more than three point five, ovarian volume more than two, and as sir discussed, an ET thickness more than three may be worn as, and a five is indicative of an imminent pensis. But again, they've clearly mentioned that this is not diagnostic and just to be used as supportive uh, test. So what you need to remember is that many patients come to us who may have some yes. uh, puberty and then go down. Yes. This is a very well-known phenomenon. Now, many of these are not mentioning that. They may present with some breast development, like the girl who came mm -hmm. to us, who had some development and, and then, then again came down. So these sort of things may happen. It's not, it's just like a, some child has started walking, he mm -hmm. may fall down and then rise again and fall down. Yes. There may be some stuttering also. So don't just go by only one figure. Mm -hmm. Maybe follow-up is also important in that sense. Yes. Uh, what about neuroimaging? Uh, basically, it is to look for CNS pathologies like hematomas, gliomas, etc. So what they have mentioned is all boys, irrespective of age, and all girls who are less than six years of age need a neuroimaging. Why? Because 38% of boys with CPP and 6.3% of girls with CPP may have some neuro uh, issues. But an interesting fact is that only 1.6% of the girls who have a CNS abnormality actually required any intervention for that. So I remember very well when I presented this work from AIMS about uh, maybe around 2001 two or the same lines about organic pathologies and the factors which predict organic pathology. We found age of onset, basal LH, stimulated LH. Then mm -hmm. people came up and asked that, what did you do for these? Yes. And most of these cases were like hematoma mm -hmm. or many of these benign things where nothing can be done in that setting. Yes. So this is a very important point to remember that 75% of girls will not have a pathology which requires something to be done. 6.3 and 1.6. Yes, so 25 percent will require. So those 25 percent could be uh, hydrocystis. Mm -hmm. This is something which we see very often. Arachnoid cyst. Mm -hmm. That is the second one. The third would of course be some form of tumors. Mm -hmm. That is and radiation is of course the obvious thing. So again, while we need to do an MRI, most may not require any intervention in that setting. So as a conclusion, it is optimum to discuss the pros and cons of MRI scanning with the parents and assist them in making an informed decision. Now the question comes, who to treat? So the, some obvious questions, some obvious scenarios are there such as girls less than seven years, boys less than nine years with clear cut central precocious puberty and advanced uh, rapid linear growth. Of course, start the genage therapy. But what we most commonly get are these girls between seven to eight years of age who have suddenly developed breast staging two. And it's not very advanced, it's just breast staging two. So in this cases that they have also mentioned, look at the adult predicted height, look at how advanced she is and look at the current height. If the adult predicted height is not uh, less, if her height is good, then we need not do anything and wait for an observation period and look for the pubertal progression rather than starting GNRH immediately. Uh, hence, they are stressing exhaustive on parenting counseling with respect to height benefits and of course the cost before starting. It. Other big thing to remember here is that in our setting, patients will come not at breast 2, they will come at breast 4, mm -hmm. breast 3. Yes. So what you need to know is the graph, there's a very good graph which is there in the current spurling, which talks about pubertal stages, percentile and ages. So actually you will know that for B4, the 95th percentile will be different. Yes. So you can say, mm -hmm. okay, now, so it will be like eight and a half years. So mm -hmm. if you have B4, then you say, okay, you can't use that eight cutoff, so it is mm -hmm. nine and a half. So mm -hmm. that becomes important. So you have to co uh, correlate breast development with eight. the age, age on that. Now, the third question is how to treat. And of course, sir has very nicely explained to us about all the formations, formulations. So I would like to stress that here, lupronide acetate is the most commonly used. Uh, as the sir said, USA started with a higher dose of 7.5 mg, progressing to 11.25 mg. Whereas Eurasian countries start with a 3.75 mg uh, formulation monthly, whereas three month depot is 11.25 mg. Now, as we know, uh, per se, as the uh, study by Carol et al. mentions that they had used 11.25 mg for more than 20 uh, kg and they were satisfied with the results of that. But per se, weight categories and weight criteria has not been formed till now. And one important uh, thing they've mentioned is that weight based dozing is no longer recommended, like less. Uh, MCG per kg dosing is not recommended for lupulite acetate. Which is logical mm -hmm. also because uh, the injection is expensive also. So you can't say you just throw the remaining yes, one. Yes, yes. If you have a problem, you make it more frequent. Mm -hmm. This yes, is sir. the way you go forward. Uh, now the question is how to monitor these patients. 
So, of course, most important and the extremely important part of it is the clinical monitoring more than anything else. So, there will be slowing of the growth velocity, there will be regression or lack of progression. It might become static at that stage or they might regress, but it should not progress to the next stage of puberty. Now, an important point of this is that the bone age, which is advanced, which will stabilize and the chronological age should slowly, slowly increase, hence decrease in the ratio of BIS to CA and an increase in adult predicted height should be seen. And here I would say height as height the as bone age will be the most yes. reliable marker yes. if you combine all of them. Uh, biochemically, uh, ultra-sensitive LH or stimulated LH concentrations or sampling may be done. And these guidelines clearly say that even if you have an unsuppressed LH levels, it does not mean that puberty is not suppressed. So it says it does not support routine biochemical testing of all patients. Uh, what are the goals of the therapy? The goals of the therapy are to halt pubertal progression, halt progressive physical development and to preserve or reclaim the adult height potential. So uh, what are we looking at? So within months, we will see the reduction in height velocity and reduction in skeletal age advancement after six months is seen. Now, as we mentioned, pubic hair is not a reliable because it's a completely different axis. So they might have pubic hair which may progress or which may remain the same. Do not go by it. Now, what exactly do we consider as a treatment failure? So if there is clinical pubertal progression despite giving uh, lipolite, if there is lack of growth deceleration, continued excessive bonage advancement, and a stimulated value more than four. So in these cases, you first of all check the adherence. Are they giving it more before the uh, injection or they're giving it after the date which we've told them to come to? Is there a peripheral precautious puberty which has been missed? So in after these all these things have been taken into account, we can either increase the dose or one very simple thing can be done instead of 12 weeks, make it 10 weeks and decrease the dosing interval. Uh, so when do you discontinue the therapy? This is an individualized de uh, decision. We usually expect after stopping therapy that the pu pubertal progression will start within months. And the menses will start between months to two years, which is a very important question which are frequently asked while starting the therapy. Patient readiness, recent growth rates, and shifts in height prediction have to be taken into account. So what age exactly? There is no specified age to be mentioned, but what the guidelines state that after 12 and a half years in girls and after 14 years in boys, there is very minimal improvement in the adult height to continue it after that. The other big question which was there in front of the guideline was what will you do in somebody who comes to you late? Somebody who's come to you with a bone age which is above 12 years of age, somebody who comes to you with menarche. So I was uh, part of that discussion and a lot of us discussed that, okay, this means that they may not respond very well, mm -hmm. but we should not take off the option because whatever benefit may happen, we should give them benefits on that mm -hmm. because there are no clear-cut RCTs on that. Mm -hmm. And we have seen anecdotally that there is improvement in many cases. So just because somebody at Minarchy and she's 130, mm -hmm. you can give them hope, but of course, then you will need to this more level to discuss them in more detail yes. about that. Uh, now coming to the adverse effects, the adverse effects per se look are very minimal. Local reactions, yes, of course, slight pain might be there, which usually regresses. Allergic reactions are more about the implants of hysterion, which are given subcutaneously, but not more with the IM injections. Withdrawal beasting, as I explained, might happen one or two episodes, but if it's happening for more than two months, it is significant. Look for another cause, either peripheral precocity is there or not. I have seen problems in somebody who has established menarche. So if they had menarche for three, four episodes, and then you're giving the NRH, sometimes they have continuous bleeding, which may happen. Okay. So this is something like a estrogen withdrawal bleeding. Yes. So if you see, so imagine somebody who had a very high estrogen level and the endometrium has become thick. As soon as the supply mm -hmm. goes down and there is no progesterone, you will have that DDS. Yes. So this you need to treat with progesterone and that may take up to three to four weeks. No. This has happened a couple of times, yeah. me, but that will be like out of thousand. Yeah. Seizures, and this is seen more in cases of who already have an existing CNS abnormality like malformations, etc. But per so do you think pubertal suppression will improve seizures or worsen seizures? It should not change. What is catamenial epilepsy? <laughs> Ketamineal epilepsy is considered to be associated with minarchy. minarchy yes. I have seen patients with intellectual disabilities who have got seizures which worsen during those times. Once you give them progesterone, mm -hmm. because progesterone will suppress LH also. If you give them GNR genlock, they improve. Mm -hmm. So yes. this is a theoretical discussion. But yes, this seizure is unrelated. Seizure is... Uh, prolonged QT interval. Now, so this is basically, yes, it has been known to increase the QT interval, but only the studies are done only in adult males. So if any individual who is on any drugs prolonging the QT interval or any pre-existing cardiovascular issues are there, 
only then do we require a screening ecg otherwise normally it is absolutely not required now uh, coming to the next such as the slip capital femoral epiphysis yes it may be seen it is very very rare so any joint any gait abnormalities you just ask the patient otherwise nothing to be done about it and uh, lastly uh, pituitary apoplexy seen only in adult male prostate cancer therapy not seen in uh, children uh, who are being treated now coming to some other issues uh, with respect to gnrh therapy allow, uh, apart from the precocious puberty a very hot debate is that whether it will increase in the height potential of any individual so certain previous studies were done in children such as balducci et al who said that in patients who were given gnrh analog and gh who were short it did not show much improvement even similarly in this consensus statement by carol et al it shows that use of gnrh analogs for conditions other than cpp requires additional investigations that cannot be suggested routinely now this therapy, this study was recently reduced, uh, released in the endocrine uh, journal which showed that combined therapy with gnrh analog and gh in iss and even some non iss children showed some uh, growth improvement with normal pubertal onset but this is like a very controversial yes. area so this is the most common controversy which is there and we'll discuss about this in case also yes, but you have to be very very cautious yes, it will yes. depend upon how short the child is if the child is very very short then you can give them mm -hmm. as a desperate measure but if child is like in a reasonable age you say no to that situation so finally the consensus what the growth hormone society says is that the use of gnrh analogs to delay epiphyseal closure as a single agent is not at all indicated yes you may use it with gh if there is ghd on or sg or silver russell syndrome if the height as this is low at the pubertal onset what our guidelines what we are discussing right now mention that in ghd you use it only when you have a malignancy where ghd and cpp is there or if you are using it with uh, just for ghd they do not advise it for routine practices and finally what we have to say about this use of gnrh analogs alone lacks efficacy these are purely experimental and